You're locked into the only podcast for Maine high school basketball. The biggest names, past and present. It's Big Time Hoops, the podcast, right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Big Time Hoops, the podcast. And uh, when it comes to big time, big time coaches, I thought that's what I was getting into. When I, when I, when I reached out to this guy, I thought I'm going to get one of the big time coaches on on here, but come to find out, he's actually a big time player. I, did, I didn't know this until today. Former Mr. Basketball, not just a basketball coach, but Mr. Basketball from 1990, current Edward Littlehead coach. We got Mike Adams joining us tonight. Coach, how are you doing? We're doing great, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I found out a bunch of things. I was doing some research today, and I, like I said, I thought I just was going to reach out to Mike Adams, the coach. I didn't realize that I was reaching out to Mike Adams, a, a former stud and a big timer in his own, all in his own right. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, I'm anxious to find out more about that, about the playing days. But before we do that, we were just talking a little bit about how it's, it's weird, and hopefully there's a season coming up here. As, as a coach, what has this time been like for you? Because you, should, you guys should be in practice right now and getting ready for the season, but a lot of uncertainty. It's been, yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been a struggle for all of us, you know, um, you know, starting right from the summer, you know, at first, I mean, Hey, we were, we were grateful. Um, we were a week and a half, two weeks away from not getting our state championship in last year. Right. And we talk about that a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of States, they stopped, you know, right, right, right before they got to their championship game. So we were, we we're very grateful that we were able to get ours in, um, win or lose. I mean, just, just to be able to have the experience of being in one is, is incredible. And then, you know, summer basketball is huge for us. So we, we do a lot in the summer and I love summer basketball as much as I love our high school season. I, I think, I think I love summer basketball even more. Um, and, and we do a lot. We go to a team camp every summer. We've been to places like Marshall and we've been to uh, NC state and Princeton and West point. Um, we bring our boys out uh, just all over the East coast to, experience something different but obviously we couldn't do that this summer um you know and, and right into you know like you said right now we should be starting up and we should be um getting ready to go but um it's it's been a challenge not to be able to do the things that we want and to have the connections with the kids you know i just emailed some of the kids today said you know i, I don't even i mean at, at every little you know we, we went remote last week because we'd got like eight cases um at every little high school um, but even before then, with the hybrid, I don't see any of my kids. I see maybe three or four of them um, in normal day to days. And you just miss seeing the kids and having the interaction with them. So I've been talking to a lot of players uh, recently and just getting their input, asking them, you know, what they're doing to stay ready. And as a player, it's a little bit easier. I mean, all you got to do is, you know, worry about yourself, stay in shape, work on your game, and you get ready for the season that way. As a coach, though, you're kind of responsible for a group of people. So, what have the challenges been like for you being responsible for, for a group of people in, instead of just, you know, an individual? What kind of challenges has that presented to you? A lot of challenges. Definitely a lot of challenges. Number one, I mean, you know, you're just worried about the, the general welfare of your kids, making sure they're okay um, and trying to reach out to them, and, you know, make sure that they're doing okay and making sure that they have food, making sure that, you know, that they're safe and, and things are going well. Um, then checking on grades, you know, making sure they're doing what they need to do. Um, you know, as a teacher and as a dad, the, the COVID depression is real. You know, what these kids are going through is, is we all are, but at least as adults, we can handle it a little bit better sometimes. But, you know, some of these kids, you know, they, they just, everything's been taken away from them. So you worry about them emotionally and psychologically. And then, you know, you get the phone call or the text, hey, can, can we get into a gym? Can you find us a gym? And you just can't find anything. You know, we're, we're lucky. The spring was nice, so we have a nice outdoor court called the Troy Barney's Court now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, kids have been able to get outside and, you know, be as smart and as safe as they can. You know, it's, it's been amazing. You've seen a lot of kids out there playing with masks and doing the right things, and, um, and some not, and, and that's kind of a, a personal pre preference with some of that stuff as well. Um, but just, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a challenge. It, it's really hard. You mentioned uh, the, the troubles and the issues that COVID brings. I mean, one of, one of the positive things that people may point to with COVID is it allowed them to spend more time maybe at, at home or do things they normally didn't get to do. Um, how quickly did that, did that kind of go away for you? Like, at what point were you like, okay, like, I'm, I'm, ready, I'm ready to get back to basketball here. Like, I want things to kind of get back to normal. Like, when did the itch set, set back in for you? I think April. <laughs> April. 
you know, we, you know, if you did the house projects that, that, that I'm able to do, I'm not super handy around the house, but, you know, just the, from getting stuff done that you wanted to get done to organizing things, you know, I like, like a lot of coaches, you know, I have a ton of stuff saved on my computer, but I finally organize things and put them in files and folders and all the places, <laughs> categorize everything the way I wanted to. Um, so you know that, but yeah, seriously, like by April. And, and again, <laughs> when people ask me if there's going to be a season, you know, or when they were asking right now, it looks like there's going to be, and fingers crossed there will be. I'm the guy that when, when we first left in, in March, you know, I, I was telling the kids at school, hey, we'll be, we'll be back after April break, you know? <laughs> um, and maybe I'm right. Maybe it will be this coming April break that we're back. <laughs> hope not, but uh, so I, you know, I, I really don't know, but yeah, we miss it. We, we need normalcy. Definitely. No question. Yeah. Um, so we're going to come all the way back around here. I want to go back to the beginning because I touched on you as a player and I want to kind of find out, you know, how, how you got to that point and then what took you from being a player to being a great coach. So we're going to go back. So I know you went to Mountain Blue, but what town did you actually grow up in? I grew up in Farmington. And yep. for, for most kids that grow up in small town, Maine, it can, it can kind of be a, a curse when it comes to basketball because you don't get the, uh, the exposure that maybe some of the bigger city kids get or your know, access to the same facilities and programs and stuff like that. But for small town Maine kids that grew up in a college town, it's kind of a blessing, right? So were you, were you a UMF fan? Were you a Beaver fan growing up? Is that like your first basketball experience that you can remember? Yeah, um, you know, my, I was lucky. Um, Coach Bessie um, is a legend in, in Maine high school basketball. And, and, and I, I'm biased, I played for him, but you know, he, and he's still coaching at UMF as an assistant coach. His basketball mind and his ability to um, connect with kids and motivate kids is just, it's, it's the best in the state and, and, and probably beyond that as well. Um, so, you know, I grew up playing for Coach Bessie in the summertime and, and, you know, we really modeled what we do in the summer off from him. So my first experience was, you know, Coach Bessie and, and Mount Blue and, and having UMF right there. You know, we went to a lot of UMF games as well, but um, we were Cougars. You know, we were the Cougars, and, and we had more Cougar pride, love that. But I remember, you know, th this goes way back. This I'm dating myself here, you know, playing when UMF would play, you know, St. Joe's, and Creature Double Feature, they used to call that, you know, and, and um, Hassan and, 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 and some of those games. So those were great. And I remember Mike Nelson, who's at TA now, when he played, he was a senior in college when I was a senior in high school. And uh, Chris Hassan and and um, some of those guys, so Vince Skulko, and uh, so yeah, we saw a lot of great games. And and I'll tell you, every once in a while, some of those old feeds come up on NBR of like Hudson versus Colby or or some of those games. Division three basketball, it doesn't get it the 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 reputation uh, or the credit that it really deserves. And you know, even today, but boy, back in the in the late eighties and early nineties, Division three basketball in Maine was it was real. It was good. They were some great players and great teams. High school basketball too, right? So and a lot of the former players that I talked to, uh, they mentioned that when they were kids, they were the ones kind of sitting in the first row at these games, watching the people before them and kind of falling in love with the game that way. Yeah. I mean, was that the case for you? Like you mentioned you were, you were a Cougar. Like were you going to Cougar games at a young age and just loving everything about high school basketball? No question. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the thousand people in that old big Mount Blue gym all the time. You know, seeing those old Morse teams that were just phenomenal, Waterville, um, Coney um, coming into town. Um, it, yeah, the KVAC back in the late 80s was just unbelievable. It was, the competition was great every single night. And, and um, yeah, we were there, like you said, all, the, all my little buddies okay, in one little section. They had the zoo crew on the other side because we weren't big enough to sit in the zoo crew. It was a, it was a Friday night affair in, in farms. Like you said, it's small town and the whole town comes out, it was exciting. So it's changed a little bit in terms of, you know, what kids do in the summertime and how they get better. You know, now it's like trainers and stuff like that. Growing up, were you just outdoors on the playground, you and your friend just playing all the time? Is that how you came up? Yeah, it's funny, like uh, growing up, uh, I was a late bloomer um, and I wasn't real good when I was younger. And my parents weren't athletes. Um, Coach Bessie had his summer program and people went there because just because you, that's kind of what you did. Um, but I never really 
it wasn't really that important to me when I was really young. But wow, like you said, I mean, growing up in Farmington, you're, 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 you're fishing, you're, you know, going through the woods and making forts. And when you're really little and stuff like that, you know, and, and, um, but really when I got into high school, um, you know, I played because I always did, but never really dedicated myself to it. And I remember my sophomore year, Coach Bessie sat me down and said, Hey, listen, you know, you could be pretty good. And, and back then, like, you know, it, 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 1980s, 90s basketball, it was different than it is now with, you know, Golden State and, and, and three-point shooters and everything like that. It was, it was get the ball in the paint. And Coach Bessie and his assistant coach, Chris Brinkman, who was a great player from Mount Blue uh, back in the early 80s, um, you know, they had a, a, a tradition of always having one of the best post players um, in the state. So when he told me, you know, you have the potential and, and – you could be good if you, if you want it bad enough. I was always a coach bad if you want it bad enough. <laughs> um, so that kind of lit the fire underneath my butt to get me working and moving. And I went from, you know, I wasn't super tall when I was younger, not that I'm super tall now, six five, six six, and, you know, back then really skinny and not, you know, strong or coordinated to really motivate me to work hard. And, and then it was an obsession. Then it was, it was you know, all day, every day, all the time, lived it, breathed it, and wanted to do it all the time. And, you know, we go down to Hippic Field. That was our park um, in Farmington. And the UMF kids would be down at Hippic Field. And, you know, older guys uh, that graduated from Mountain Blue, the pickup games down there were just – you people can't even imagine today what a pickup game like that is like when you have 25 or 30 guys and you've got a five-on-five -five game going and winners stay and it's called yeah. your own foul. You, you better make sure that it's a foul. Because if, <laughs> if you call the foul, then, I mean, people are going to kill you. You know, they were going to they were going to be really mad about that. Um, and then when you lose, you're sitting for half an hour, 45 minutes. You know, I mean, games meant something. Every single game meant something. And they were battles down at Hippic Field at nighttime every single night. It was fun. You mentioned being a late bloomer, and I was doing some research today. So, obviously, the bloom late did well, was crowned Mr. Basketball, but – also, your senior year was the only time you made an all-state team. So I, I find that kind of odd or kind of – you don't see too often where someone who wins Mr. Basketball just kind of gets their first all-state down as a senior as well. So when, when did things click for you? When did it all start finally coming together? Was it just that senior year or did it, it kind of just gradually build up? Yeah, it was, it was the summer of my senior year, you know, my, my sophomore year. And, it, it, you know, again, like things were so different back, back then, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s. You know, to be a sophomore on varsity in a good varsity program, that didn't happen very often. And I was on JVs as a sophomore and had a good sophomore year on JVs. And our, our, our varsity team was really good. Uh, they had a guy by the name of Paul Searles who went to St. Joe's, a 6'7 lefty. Um, he scored 1,000 points in two years at St. Joe's. At St. Joe's. And then um, tendonitis in both of his knees kind of ended his career. Uh, but he was a stud. I mean, he was real, real good. So, you know, I wasn't going to play – in front of or even with him you know we, we were real good um and then my junior year I played varsity and um you know our team wasn't we missed the playoffs by like four tenths of a heel point or something crazy like that Oxford Hills and coach Grafham beat us twice that year on half court shots <laughs> uh, I'll never forget that uh but it you know again it motivated me and then um yeah that's that summer into my senior year you know that's when um you know I, I was in the UMF weight room working out with some of some of the guys in their weight room. Um, I was at um, Coach Bessie's summer camp every day. I was at Hippic Field every day. Um, and again, different times. I tell my son this all the time. You know, back then, you know, Ernie and Gator were the uh, were the janitors at Mount Blue. I'll never forget Ernie and Gator because in, in 1990, you can go into the gym that Friday at four o'clock and, and say. Uh, have your ball and they hear a ball bouncing and Ernie and Gator come over and check and say, what's going on? I said, oh, hey, Mike. And I said, hey, Ernie, hey, Gator. And, and, and they let you do those things. It was a different time. You know, right. you could do those things and you can't do that now. Um, your senior year, was that the, your only time ever getting to the auditorium? You, I'm guessing you guys made the playoffs. I'm guessing you guys had some team success if you had, had the individual success. So. Yeah, yeah. We had, a, we had a good team and I think, um, you know, we had a, a 
guy by the name of Ryan Live, whose dad was the soccer coach at UMF for years, legendary coach uh, at UMF. And Ryan Live was a lefty uh, two guard. Um, he went to UNH for soccer, surprise, and was an All American in, in soccer. And, um, you know, we had a, um, we were small, though. Like I was our biggest guy. Our next biggest guy was like 6'1. Uh, so that was our downfall. But again, Coach Bessie's a great coach. I mean, we were, we were, we were in the running. Um, you know, we beat uh, Presque Isle in the first round of the playoffs with Chris Cassidy, who was a great player. And that was a battle. And then uh, back in the 80s and 90s, everybody's nemesis um, was the Bangor Rams, and they got us in the semis. Uh, but we were hoping to get one more shot at Coach McGee and the Lawrence Bulldogs, and, and they, were, they were phenomenal. They won states that year um, with Lenny Cole and, and uh, Scott Walker. Um, they, they were big and they were physical, just the old 1990s Lawrence physical D top teams. Uh, but we were hoping to get a third shot with Lawrence because they beat us twice in the regular season. And uh, I never beat Lawrence. And Coach McGee reminds me of that whenever I see him. So <laughs> we're hoping to, hoping to get another chance. To, yeah. To so him. one thing I like talking to guys about that I got to play in the auditorium was your auditorium experience and what you remember most. So, I mean, the capacity didn't change over the course of the auditorium's lifetime. But for whatever reason, if you look at pictures from like the 80s and 90s, it just seems like there was a lot of people in there. Yeah. And I, I wonder what your experience, looking back on it, what do you remember most from playing in those auditorium games, especially against like some great, great programs like you mentioned? Oh, it was, like you said, I mean, Presque Isle's going to bring the whole town. You know, Bangor, obviously, it's right there. They're going to bring everybody. <laughs> Waterville and Coney is going to bring everybody. Um, but what I remember is it, when you stepped out on that floor, okay, it just went straight up. Those seats went straight up. And the, and the roof, right, V down. So all the noise from the crowd just came down on the floor and it was just, it was deafening. It was, it was an, it was an unbelievable. And, and you know, people always, you know, crapped on the floor and dead spots and, and all this and all that, to be honest with you, okay, you don't even, I, I don't even, and it was over 30 years ago too. So you, you forget some of those things, but you don't even remember those things because just the atmosphere was just so great. It brings right. everything else up. It was incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, this is my next question. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, cause you were a local kid, Farmington, Mr. Basketball, probably could have went to many places when it came to college, but you, you didn't stay local. You went to, you went to where? You went to Thomas, right? Yeah. So yeah. was, was there some controversy there? Did UMF feel hurt when you decided to just leave you know, town? What was that like? I think, um, I think, you know, UMF was going through some, some coaching changes at that time. They, they've changed coaches three or four times. Um, in, in a short time, um, and Coach Dodge was the coach then, and, and, and we sat down and talked, and he said, hey, Mike, you know, obviously I'd love to have you come to UMF, but I get it's your hometown if you want to get out and do something. He, and he was, it was the perfect recruiting pitch, if you will, and it wasn't high pressure. It wasn't, you know, anything else. It was just we'd love to have you. If you want to come, you can. Um, and Coach Booth um, was at Thomas, and he's at Norwich now. Um, you know, he, he, he was trying to build that program back up um, from when Coach Meter had left. Coach Meter um, obviously was a great coach, one of the best in the history of the state as well. And then, when, when, then he went to UMF after I had graduated uh, from college. Um, but Coach Booth was a young coach. He was from New York, and he was just, you know, trying to make things happen. And, you know, um, I, I was a main kid, so I didn't want to go too, too far away. And this was before AAU, so I, you know, I didn't get – and I was a late bloomer, so I didn't get much exposure in terms of playing anywhere else out of that. Um, but Thomas had a really neat program where it was called the Maine State Teachers Scholarship. And um, so if your grades were good enough, um, basically it was, it was almost a full academic scholarship. Um, and I probably – when they read – it was, I think there was 10 of them that they had given out. And uh, when they read all of the um, accomplishments of all of the award winners, I think I, think I might have brought the average down a little bit. <laughs> some of those things. Uh, but I was a good student, and I worked hard um, to get good grades. So um, it was really, you know, a no-brainer. I mean, uh, Colby, uh, Thomas, USM, and St. Joe's were kind of my final four list of what I wanted to do. And it just, I felt at home at Thomas. They were, they were my kid. 
And um, my daughter is at Thomas right now, which is kind of cool as a freshman. And I think one of the things that I didn't realize this at the time, but like one of the things I told my daughter, because I heard this from somebody else, and they said, you know, go in the cafeteria, okay, and, and hang out for like 20 minutes and just see, do I fit in with this kid, okay? Is, is this my kind of kid? And Thomas was my kind of kid, you know? It was like wearing sweatpants and T-shirts and hanging out and, you know, just doing our thing. And, and that was my kind of place. And I had a great, a great time at Thomas College, best, best time ever. Was there any cross time rivalry with Kobe? Like when you were there, like did the guys, the Thomas guys in the off season go to Kobe or did the Kobe guys come to Thomas? Like, was there like a little uh, cross town rivalry with, with hoops at all? No, not really. You know, I think, you know, there was, and again, this is before the days of social media. So like, you know, we, we kind of had perceptions of, of, of the Lawrence kid and we had perceptions of the Colby kid and everybody does and say, Oh, that's the rich kid. That's the snobby kid. That's the, you know, uh, driving my BMW kind of, you know I mean? It was like, so they did their thing and we did our thing. And to be honest with you, Colby was freaking way too good back then. You know, they beat us <laughs> by like 40 my freshman year. Um, you know, they had, you know, Delanus and Whitmore and, and Rivas, these guys that were just like, um, Delanus was a Division three All-American and, 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 and Matt Gaudet. Um, you know, gosh, he was, uh, I think a year behind me. Um, they were phenomenal. I mean, that was like one of the best D3 programs okay, in, in, in New England. So growing up, you were kind of exposed to two different sets of rivalries, the Mount Blue rivalries and the UMF rivalries. Uh, when you got to college, did you have like any like, uh, memories from your childhood, or, like certain colleges that would come to UMF being like, oh man, I can't wait. To, I want to play those guys down the road. Like, were there any like hard feelings from being a UMF, a UMF fan growing up that you were anxious to kind of take out on these these programs when you got to college? Yeah, I think yeah, like you know, like St. Joe's and Huston were always super good back then. You know, really athletic and big and strong, and and um, and UMF would always have battles with both of them. And you know, a lot of times came out on the short end just because they were. I mean, like, again, like. They, they, were, they were just so, so good. So, yeah, looking forward to playing, you know, St. Joe's and Hassan, just because that was always seen as some of the best Division three programs um, in the state and wanting to see if you can match up and, and beat those guys, definitely. So one guy who uh, – he graduated a year before you, but I think he went to Hassan, right? Ray Alley, right? He, he oh, yeah. Was, yeah. I haven't had anyone on the podcast who could, who could speak to Ray Alley, but I, I know the name. And I think he might even still be playing nowadays. I think I, I know people that say he still will play ball from time to time. Can you speak yep. to Ray Alley and the kind of player this guy was? He was a bulldog. He <laughs> was 5'9", okay? Um, big, thick, strong, upper body, quick, great handle, and an unbelievable shooter and a fierce competitor. I mean, he would just come at you all the time. He was, he was tough and phenomenal. And then you throw – you know, they're always going to get a 6'10 kid, okay? Every year, it was like some guy that was at a Division One school, okay, and something happened, and he didn't go back, and boom, he's coming in the hustle. Like every year, it was a new 6'10 guy coming in, okay? And they'd always have 6'5", 6'6", three or four athletes around him. Um, and, and he was just uh, – Ray Alley was – he was the real deal. Yeah, I mean, he went to Maine um, when he graduated um, from, from Vinyl Haven, um, I think he was there for, I'm not sure if it was a semester or a year, um, and he could have played at Maine. I mean, he was good enough. He was strong enough. Um, but he went to Hassan, and, and he was phenomenal. He was tough. Yeah. And you, uh, you had some success, too. I saw over 1,500 points in Thomas. So you, you, had, a, you had a pretty good career yourself. Um, so a lot of the coaches that I've interviewed, they, they said they knew, like, once they got to college, like, they just wanted to get through college, and then they wanted to get right into coaching afterwards. Was coaching in the back of your mind as you were kind of wrapping up college? Is, is that something you, you knew you wanted to do? Or did it really come into the picture later on? I think, again, I was a late bloomer with that, too. I think um, going to Thomas back then, it was just a business school. You know, they, had, they, they offered, like, elementary education. Uh, but almost everything else was just business. And it's funny, it's, as a teacher now, in, my, in the classes I teach, I teach business classes, it's one of the things that we talk about is what motivates people. And when you're... 21, 22, 23 years old, I think money is, is a big motivating factor. And it still is 
even at 48, it does motivate you, but you know, not quite as much. Uh, so I thought, yeah, I want to, I thought I want to work for a big company and wear a suit and tie and carry a briefcase and make a lot of money and do all that. And then, um, you know, I did the corporate thing for a couple of years. And I remember coach Bessie asked me to come back and, and talk at his summer program one day, <laughs> excuse me. And, um, and we were talking, you know, I was talking about, you know, what I did as a player and how hard I worked in the summertime to make myself better and the commitment of what it takes, you know, and, and hoping that some of them would, would find that as well. And he, afterwards we were eating lunch, coach and I, and, and he said, Hey, you miss it, don't you? And I said, yeah, I really do. And he said, have you ever thought about getting back into coaching? And like, it just, a light went off. And I said, yeah, I, I want to do that. So, um, I quit my job and, um, went back to Mount Blue and, um, I got a job basically as an ed tech and I was coaching JVs for coach Bessie for two years. And then, um, like a teaching position just didn't open up. And, um, you know, I was married at the time and, and my wife was like, okay, it's, we tried this long enough. It's time to, it's not working. Um, but I, eventually I got a job at Lewiston high school of all places and their athletic director there now, his name is Jason Fuller. Um, he had gotten the head coaching job. So I worked at Lewiston for a couple of years with him, had a great time and a great experience. It was great for me as a coach because all I had ever really known was coach Bessie. Like how he coaches and what he does. And Jason Fuller is young, fresh out of college, you know, had never been a head coach before. And it's a, it's a definitely a different kid at Lewiston high school versus at Mount Blue high school. So I, I, I think it taught me a lot about how to be a better coach and how to be a better teacher and, and a better person. Um, and then, um, I, I, I really didn't know if I wanted to be a head coach and that I enjoyed being an assistant coach. And then the Edward Little job opened up and uh, Jeff Benson was the athletic director and he called up and said, Hey, we have an opening. We'd, we'd love you to come over and, and interview if you want. And I said, yeah, I'll think about it. And a day or two later, I said, you know, I'll never know what, what it's like to be a head coach if I don't do it. And here's a great chance to see, what will happen. And, and uh, yeah, I had no, idea. that was 20 years ago. I had no idea that I'd be there for that long. Cause I mean, yet again, it's, 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 you hear a lot about horror stories about, you know, parents and, and, and everything else. And, and, and thankfully I, you know, I, Hey, we've had our, our deal with parents and, and I'm a parent too. I totally get it. I think that's one of the things that's maybe a better coach is being a parent and understanding their side of it. Um, but I've had great kids, you know, unbelievable kids. In 20 years, okay, I can't think of one team that I'd say I didn't enjoy coaching them or I didn't enjoy the kids on that team. You know, we've had good years and we've had a 2-16 and 16 year. I'll, I'll never forget that year. It made me a better coach. Um, and it was a long year. And it was a longer year for those kids. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I had fun, you know, all the way through. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, a couple of years, you're coaching JV, being an assistant. You know, we live in a society now where people want, they want more, they want it now, they want it fast. They kind of want to just get to where they want to be, maybe take some shortcuts. What did you learn being an assistant coach? Like, what, what did that teach you? Like, being a JV coach and an assistant, how did that help mold you and get you ready to be a head coach? Uh, you're so right. I think that's huge. I think, you know, back in the day, okay, in the 80s and 90s, to be a varsity coach, you had to be a JV coach that you had to be an assistant coach for, man, five or 10 years a lot of times. And now we're seeing a lot of um, young coaches get put in a situation where it's really hard for them to be successful. And, and we've seen some young coaches lose their jobs um, because of that. And I think, you know, I think that we need to do a better job okay, as coaches ourselves and helping those young coaches in how to deal with parents. Okay, and how to run practices and how to run your summer program okay, and, and not focus on wins and losses, but just making yourself better. And, and I think, you know, going to, you know, Coach Furbush is, is, a, is a friend and, and I love being able to say, Coach, can I stop in and watch a practice and, and, and be able to use that to make myself a better coach. Back in the day, um, when we had four classes, 
class A used to start um, after class B, C, and D. So we'd have a couple of weeks, and Coach Bessie would say, Mike, we're going to Madison. We're going to go watch Coach Maines. And we'd sit down and watch Coach Maines practice for a week and just, you know, see somebody else do it. And I've always said, like, like that would be a dream of mine is to say, I'm going to take a year off, okay? And, and even now, after 20 years, I want to go sit down and watch Coach Grafham work for a week. I love Coach Grafham. I want to see what he does and how he runs a practice. And, you know, I want to go watch Coach Hanson at Brunswick. Okay, I want to go watch Coach Millington and Coach, you know what I mean? Like, there's so many good coaches. And I, I think that the more we can watch them and learn from them, that, that makes us a better coach as well. Something else you touched on, too, that I hadn't really thought about was, um, you know, growing up in, in Farmington, being in that Mount Blue program, and then settling in a place like Lewiston, then eventually Auburn, and just being surrounded by a different set of kids than maybe what you grew up with. What kind of challenges did that present? Because, I mean, I'm guessing it may not be the, the most easy to relate to having grown up different. So did, did that present challenges for you? I mean, it's tough enough being a head coach for the first time, but maybe dealing with, uh, with different kids that are, or different backgrounds that you didn't quite grow up in yourself. Was that a challenge as well? Yeah, I think it definitely is. There's no question. I think um, I, I read a great book um, a long time ago from a good friend of mine who suggested it. And uh, the name of the book was um, Lead for God's Sake. And I misread the title <clears throat> at first. I thought it was Lead for God's Sake. You know what I mean? But no, it's, it was, it, and it wasn't an overly religious book, nor am I overly religious myself. Um, but basically it was a book about a coach um, who was coaching this team that was supposed to win a state championship and all the pressure that he put on himself. And what he found to make himself a better coach was it's about building relationships with your kids. And it really opened up my eyes to a lot of, a lot of things that I can do better. And I think you're right. I mean, I think that um, in, a, in a community like Auburn um, versus Mount Blue in 1990 and, and in, Farmington in 1990, it was probably 99.7% white and um, not an awful lot of diversity. And you come to Lewiston and Auburn um, and next to Portland, you know, some of the most diverse cities in Maine, still not as diverse as some of your other cities in the country, you know, but it's, 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 it's been great to find out about kids and, and a kid that played for me um, who was actually <clears throat> um, a Muslim kid, um, and um, you know, again, any anybody um, in in Lewiston, Auburn, that's Muslim. Everybody's gonna think they're Somalian. He was Ethiopian. Um, it was Yusuf Iman, um, who ended up playing at UMF. Um, we became really, really close, and that was a, a great experience for me to find out about somebody from a different country from a different culture, um, who has some different beliefs in things. And what's great is he and I, you know, I took him under my wing when he was a freshman, you know, and I'm picking him up for some of basketball every morning and he's lifting with me after school every day. And really he didn't have a dad, you know, kind of a, a father son relationship. And I'm, I'm proud and glad that he looks at me like a dad, uh, but we could talk about anything. You know, I could tell him when he was messing up, and he could tell me when he thought I was messing up, and, and I, and I might have been, you know? But we could talk about anything from religion to, you know, things that kids go through to the struggles as a dad and as a coach. And um, it's really neat to, to build those relationships and find out more about your kids because every kid has a story. And it's our job as a coach to dig in and find out what that story is. Absolutely. So those are just some of the challenges that you face being a head coach for the first time. Another challenge too, like you jumped right into it. Class A basketball in Maine. Like that's, that's not, a, not, not the easiest place to start. What, what kind of program were you inheriting when you took over to, at Edward Little? I was lucky. I was really lucky. Uh, they, the year before I got there, they were young. They had a bunch of sophomores that were playing up and they weren't ready. And that was the old SMAA. So they were playing Deering, South Portland, Portland, who was just loaded back in those days, and they still are, um, and they struggled. And, and, and the old coach, you know, he had left. <clears throat> so I came in, he did the groundwork. And um, I changed the system, obviously. We played a little bit different than they did. But 
the way that we played was built for the kids that, that we had. And we really shocked everybody. We opened up the gearing on the first night with Nick Kaner medley. And he still scored 36. I'll never forget. <laughs> but, but our sixth man, who was our shooter, um, he rolled his ankle in practice two days before. So I said, oh, man, we're a man down already. And, and I think we only lost by like seven or eight. And Deering was beating everybody by 40. This was game one, but they beat everybody by 40 all year. So we knew that we were going to be in for something pretty good. Um, and we went 13 and five, I think, that first year. Okay. And uh, made it to the semifinals and uh, got blown out by Deering by 40. So they, you know, they made they, up for it. Yeah. They, they did make up for it in a bigger setting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was just, but again, those kids were only juniors then. You know, so we came back the next year, okay, and same thing. We had a great year and, and, and made a good run. And then we lost to Chevrolet and Coach Brown, and, okay, and they beat us by 40. So we didn't have much luck in the, in the semifinals the first couple of years. Um, but, yeah, I, mean, I, I got lucky. I came into a program that had some players that were good. They just – nobody knew about them because they were just too young when I came into it. And then the talent just kept on coming through. So as you kind of get a little bit later in, in the 2000s, so Troy Barnes comes along, Kyle Philbrook comes along, Bo yeah. Leary. So you had some players coming, coming, uh, coming through later on. What was the evolution of the program? Was it, it, I always wonder, like, when a coach decides to kind of implement a system and make his players adapt to a system versus a coach adapt to the players he has. Like, how did you weigh that as a coach? Like, do you have a system that you guys run and players must adapt to it? Or did you kind of learn that, you know, I'm going to, base what we do off the off the talent we have yeah i think you know when i first came in I, again i was young and foolish and said you know we're going to do a lot of the same things coach bessie did because right. that's what i grew up and that was my mentor and, and then you know i learned you know i'm not coach bessie you know um furthest thing from it and i gotta do my, <laughs> do my own thing um and and like we started doing a lot of the same things that that i knew from mount blue but you know as i grew as a coach and I understood, you know, we can't always do the same things. And, and we have to adapt to what we have for strengths and what we have for athletes and players. So, yeah, we changed it up a little bit. But a lot of, you know, what's always consistent is what we do in the summer. What's always consistent is, you know, what we try to be off the court. And we really try to stress that. And, I, and I'm a big believer that, you know, success breeds success. And, and you know, again, not to keep going back to it, but coming from the Mountain Blue program, you know, we always had a good post player, not because, you know, there was always going to be somebody who was 6'5", 6 6'6", six, 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 but because, okay, that's what we worked on. It, 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 it's, it's something that was developed and grown. And, you know, every year at Mount Blue, there was always a, one or a group of kids who dedicated themselves in the summertime to being there all day to getting up to 10,000 shots in the summer, to being in the weight room and doing that. And as a young kid growing up, you saw that success. And that's what you wanted to have. And when I got to EL, I said, you know, one of the first things that we have to do is we have to identify somebody that can be that kid. So for the next four to five years, every kid coming up is going to want to be, and it was Troy Barnes, was going to want to be Troy Barnes. You know, Troy Barnes, he was a freshman in my third year when I was at EL, and we weren't real good. You know, that was our two and 16 year. And I looked at him and said, I told the coach, Bessie, hey, you could be pretty good. You know, you could be pretty good. I think that you could be a good player. And, um, you know, he played football. He ran track. You know, Saturday morning in September, <clears throat> you know, they had a football game Friday night. You know, he's like, coach, you're going to come pick me up? Yep, I'm on the way, 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay, we're picking Troy up. We're going to lift. And then he's going to his football practice. You know, and he dedicated himself to making himself a great basketball player and a great person. So then again, you know, for the next four or five years, okay, we got that Troy Barney's card that we're holding out saying, hey, listen, this is what happened when you worked hard. I'm not saying you're going to go to Maine or Division One or play overseas, but he made himself into a great player. And like you said, you know, we had Kyle Philbrook come in after that and we had Bo Leary come in after that and, and then it just kept kind of going on. And then – you know, we're at the point now, I mean, Troy's still down in the summer, you know, so, but he's, he's old enough now that those guys don't remember him playing. They wouldn't have seen that, but we have other players that are kind of taking the place, you know, from most recently Wall or, or, or anybody else that have come through our program. Absolutely. 
So you mentioned those guys in the late 2000s, and then you guys got to a point where, you know, you guys might have been favored to win a state championship. What was that like, kind of transitioning? I mean, you came into a good program. You guys were good right off the bat. But to get to the point where you guys were seriously competing for state championships, what was that transition like for you? It, uh, the first, I'll never forget the first state championship you're in, you're like, <clears throat> you know, I might never get another chance. We might never get back here again. I, I know a lot of coaches that have never played in the state championship, so you got to make the most of it. We played Thornton that year, and um, and they were good. They were real good. And, um, you know, we, we had a team that wasn't big, uh, but we, we were all smart basketball players, and we were up by nine the whole game, okay? And, um, yeah, I, I, that's the one that hurts the most because I, I thought we could have won that game, uh, but we lost at the end. Some things happened at the end. Old guys that remember watching that game or remember some of the controversy at the end, but we lost it. You know, it wasn't anything else. We lost it. And, um, and then the very next year, the guys just got motivated to work even harder. That was the Yousef and James Philbert group. And, um, and then we lost to Sheva, so we lost back-to-back. So I was kind of worried that we were going to be the Buffalo Bills of Maine High School basketball, <laughs> get to a state championship but never, ever win one. And, um, and then, you know, we, again, we said that book was a good indicator for me of, of what's really important. So, hey, listen, you know, on our wall, we have the banner, like, like every gym does. Okay, of your state championships. In 1946 was the last state championship that EL had been. And I said, you know, we're always going to work towards winning a state championship because that would be pretty special to be able to change that banner and, and put our year up there. But all the stuff that we do in the summer, that's way more important. That's way, way more um, relevant to you and the rest. That's what you're going to talk about for the rest of your lives. But, um, but there's still teenage kids and even if you're not a teenage kid, you're still competitive and you're working your butt off to see if you can get one. Um, I don't know if we were ever really favored to win one. When we beat Scarborough, you know, they beat us in the regular season pretty good. And TA pounded us in the regular season last year. Um, but I knew we were good enough any of the years that we were in the game where we could have won one. But I also know, you know, a lot can happen, you know, uh, you know, balls bounce the wrong way and calls don't go your way. And you just got to keep battling and, and, and grinding and, and persevering and just make things happen. And, and that's what our kids did. Every year they were in it, they, you know, they battled and, and made things happen. It's been, a, it's been a fun ride. You mentioned as a coach, like you wanted, wanted to see your kids succeed. You wanted to do it for the kids. And, you know, that's what makes it tough right now with COVID is not being able to, to have this for them. But I'm, I'm wondering, as a coach, having you know lost back-to-back state title games like you just mentioned, um, selfishly, were you like, man, like I, I want this for myself, like I, I want to win a state championship too, and like, what kind of drove you and kept you motivated? Because I mean, I'm guessing that it, it could have could have been crushing, right? Yeah. Could have been crushing and a little demoralizing. They might be not demoralizing, but but what what kept you going? Like what kept you motivated to to push through that and then ultimately get a, get a couple here? Yeah, I, I, it was crushing, definitely. They were both. They were both crushing losses. You know, the TA game, we were up the whole game and, um, and lost it at the end. And, and they won it at the end. I don't want to say that they won because, you know what I mean, they were good. Um, and the Chevrolet game, we, we were getting pounded at the start. We were down 17-2. to two. Okay, that was the Indiana faithful group. And, and um, Coach Brown is one of the best coaches in the history of the game. You know, and, and, and they were phenomenal. Um, and they were kicking our butts early, and we we fought back, and we had a chance to win that one at the end too. So they were they were crushing losses, definitely, no question. Um, but I think it's just what you teach your kids, you know, uh, and your own kids. You know, I have I have kids as well. You know, life is going to kick you; it's going to have you down, and you just got to keep working and persevering. And sometimes you can keep fighting and persevering, and it's not going to matter. You know, I I I, I could be sitting here today and have lost four state championships very easily, you know, and it wouldn't make me a better coach um, or, or, or a worse coach. Um, but yeah, you want to win one. <laughs> you want to win one. I mean, and, and what's really neat for me is um, after we won the first one and uh, we had the parade back into town is, is 
um, seeing one of my players who I was really close with, and he's, he's a police officer here in Auburn. He was on duty, okay, and he was in the gym, okay, and he came over and gave me a hug and just big tears running down his face because he was just so happy for me because, he, and that's what he said, like, I wanted you to win one. I said, well, okay, and that made me cry too. I'm like, that, that means a lot, but, you know, we don't win it if it's not for you guys, you know, every team that was before that, that showed these guys how to work. We never win if they don't set that example for all these kids today. Yeah, and you mentioned so that, that example. You mentioned Troy Barney's, even though he graduated 13, 14 years ago, still being part of the program. You hear the term culture a lot when describing programs. Like, what, what, what's the Auburn culture? What is it that you guys have built and how have you built it that is just have this family atmosphere where all your former players are just, you know, still part of it? It still means a lot to them when, when you win or when the current kids win. You know, what is it about Auburn basketball, or not Auburn basketball, ever little basketball? What is, it, what is it that you guys have built there? I think, you know, we just do so much together. You know, in the summertime, um, for our high school kids, <clears throat> we come in and, and we lift as a team in the morning at 7 o'clock. And we're lucky, you know, like, you know, I'm old school, so I, I, I'm, but I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. It's like, for years, we're in there benching and squatting and curling and doing all that stuff. I, and again, I, I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. And I was lucky to meet BJ Grondon, who was a friend of Troy's and went to the University of Maine. And this is what he does. He works with athletes on being better athletes. And if you look at the NBA today, okay, again, I grew up in the 80s. I remember the New York Knicks okay, when they were all like, you know, Charles Oakley and, and Anthony Mason, and they were all <laughs> big and muscle-bound. You guys don't even know who those guys are. Um, <laughs> they were big and muscle-bound, but that was the NBA in the 80s, okay? But Kevin Durant said, hey, I can't bench press 185 pounds, okay? But put a basketball in my hand and I'll kick your butt. Okay? And, and BJ comes in in the summertime for us twice a week and works with our kids on lifting for strength or lifting for explosiveness and lifting for athleticism and then we do some of the other stuff i do the bodybuilding stuff with the kids on the other days uh, <laughs> we do that at seven o'clock in the morning you know and everybody else in the summer you know kids in other schools they're still they're still sleeping okay they're at the beach they're hanging out and then at 8 30 our varsity guys they stay or what potentially could be varsity guys they stay and they coach our little kids we do a little kids program from 8.30 until 10. That's our kindergarten through sixth grade. And then from 10 to 11.30, <clears throat> we run our program for our middle school kids. So that's when our high school kids go out and get something to eat or hang out or do something. But they come back in the gym at 11.30 and we practice for an hour and a half every day in the summer for five weeks or six weeks, whatever we can get in. And then we play games at night. And like I said, then our culture is we're going to take you someplace and we're going to do something. And we've been to some pretty neat places um, in, in the summertime. And I'll tell you what, um, again, we've been to NC State, we've been to, to Princeton, we've been to Marshall, we've been to West Point, we've been to Old Dominion. Our kids can play. Our kids can play. We played against some teams where if anybody looked out on that court and said, there's no way that team can compete with the other team, main kids can play. They, they know how to play the right way. They know how to play the game. We might be out-athleted uh, in some places or some, some games, uh, but our kids can battle with the best of them. And, and that was a real eye-opener for our kids as well because when we come back from that team camp and say, you guys just played with eight teams that would have won a state championship in Maine. So when we go back, you've got nothing to be scared of. Let's go out and, and take care of business. Absolutely. So you're coming up on, on what, over 20 over twenty years now, if you include your, your JV experience as a coach, over 20 years as a coach here in high school basketball. And I feel like you talked about growing up and the legends that were at some of these programs. Um, and I feel like nowadays you don't really see that. You don't see the coaches at a program for 20, 30 years. Here you are coming off another state championship, 20 plus years. Sounds like still loving it, still wired in it and, and wanted to keep going. How have you been able to keep this going? Like, what, what keeps you motivated and wanting to keep coaching? Like, how, you know, how come you aren't burnt out? Maybe, like, that some of these other kids or other coaches get and, and don't last as long as, as 20 years? Like, That's a great question. Someone... Yeah, yeah I, 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 I still don't think of myself, like, growing up in, in, 
graduating in 90, looking at Mike McGee's and the Jim Bessies and the Kenny Lindloss and the Scott Raffins and like those are legends. It's funny, Coach Hanson and I were talking a couple of years ago saying, he said, Mike, you and I are the, with the, with the old veteran coaches now. And I'm like, no, I can't be the old veteran coach. I'm <laughs> old enough. I'm 48, so I am old enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I, what keeps me going, it, and, and I've said this a bunch of times, when I run my summer program, um, when we run our summer program, you know, every day in the summer, we're going to have 50 kids in the gym every single day. That's what keeps me going, you know. And, hey, listen, like six of those kids will never even come close to playing in our program. You're like, you look out there and you're like, what is that kid doing <laughs> here? But he's got nothing else. And you know what? Like, we make it a point to say, hey, listen, this kid's been here every single day. God love this kid. He's having a great time. Uh, I know he's killing this drill. But he's having fun. So let's have fun with him and let's enjoy it. Let's keep things in perspective. It's summer basketball. I mean, there's times that we're going to be competitive and do things, but there's other times we're going to go out and have fun and do some of that. So that, that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me uh, motivated and, and doing the things that we do. Uh, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what I love. It's who I am. Uh, I, I love doing this, and hopefully I'll be able to do it for a lot longer. Yeah. So in doing my reading today, too, I also saw the, the health scare a couple of years back or, or maybe a year back. What did that how, how did that come into when evaluating basketball? Like, did it, did it go into that? Did it make you miss the game, love the game more? Did it maybe say make, make you say maybe, you know, it's time to back away from this and, and worry about myself? Like, how, how did that affect the way you feel about the game? Yeah, well, it was probably kind of stupid. Like when. It, I, with my heart condition, they've been telling me for years, eventually we're going to get there. We're going to have to do surgery. So I, I go, I did go to my cardiologist every six months. And um, finally, he said, okay, it's time. You have to have this surgery. So stupidly, thankfully, when my wife wasn't with me. I said, can I do it after some of basketball? <laughs> he said, okay, you can. But like, no later. He goes, this has to be done. It has to get taken care of. So, um, and then my next question was, will I be healed enough so I can coach during the season? And he said, yeah, I think you'll be okay. So, but it was, it was, it was a long year last year and I was tired because uh, I had my surgery at the end of August and they say it takes a full year to really recover from everything. But um, day two, sitting in the hospital bed, and they crack you open, and you can't move, and you can't do anything. And I look in, and six guys walk in um, with, with it's a boy balloons and <laughs> stuff like that. And it was all guys from our team. You know, it, it tells you that you're doing something right and that you're making a mark where you're supposed to make it. But, um, um, yeah, it, it definitely didn't say it's time to step back or um, ease up a little bit. I, I feel better. You know, I'm, I'm not tired like I used to be before my surgery. Uh, so I'm, hopefully I have a little bit more energy and um, yeah, just as ready to go. Yeah. So if things were all normal, you'd be in it right now. Uh, and now having won two state championships, you know what it's like to defend one. So what would going into this year be like if it were a normal year? Do you prepare differently defending a title versus chasing a title? Is it a different feel? Do you have to like kind of sit your players down like, hey, like that was last year. Now it's this year. Like. How is the mindset different from uh, going into a season as the defending champion versus trying to chase the championship? Yeah, that's funny. I mean, we did say that after winning our first one the next year, going into wall senior year, we said the same thing. Like, listen, we're not defending anything. Um, this is your team now. This is a different team. Um, so, we're, you know, we, we play different. We do things different. So let, let's just make sure we understand that. So I think, you know, whether there's a state championship this year or not, you know, I think it's the same thing, you know, as you go into the seniors, especially and say, you know, this is your year, you've worked for this. Um, we're not going to focus on what's going to happen at the end. Let's just focus on what's going to happen today and making ourselves better and, and having the year that you want to have. Before we get up out of here, I want to hit on some, uh, some random questions. This is my first one. We had, we had Troy Barney's on a while back. I think it was the summertime and it was actually maybe right after you guys had won States. And Troy was speaking finally of it. I think it was his senior year team. You guys were like, what, like 17-1 or maybe like undefeated in the regular season, something like 18 that. 18-0. Yeah. 
And yeah. I said that, that, that was a tough loss. And they, they should have won stakes that year. So I asked him, I said, your senior year team versus 2020 team who just won states, if they went head to head, who would win? Do you have any input on that? He said his team would win, obviously. <laughs> I'm going to make somebody mad no matter what I say on that one. <laughs> I, I'll tell you this that, that Troy Barney's team, okay, and Coach McGee said it because we went up and scouted Hamden that year. And I love Coach Barlett and, and Hamden, he runs a great program, you know, but I saw. Hamden beat Lawrence in the prelim game at Hamden. And, and Coach McGee still says to me to this day, he goes, Mike, I wanted to grab you after that game and say, don't underestimate him. And we didn't. You know, we, 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 were, we were definitely prepared for them. Um, but I think, like, with Troy's group, like, they'd never been to the Augusta Civic Center because that's where the tournament was for them back in that day. His junior year, we lost – to Comey in a prelim game. Um, so we never got to the tournament to play on that floor. Then we went in as the number one seed. The game was at like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and those Hamden kids, you know, they grew up in the tournament. Those kids have all played in it. So I think we were a little bit of a shock uh, with that. And we picked the worst game to play our worst game. And Hamden played great. And Coach Bartlett had a great game plan. Uh, so, I mean, um, that was one of the best teams I ever coached, though. You know, they were, they were phenomenal. They had all the pieces. And Troy was just the ultimate competitor. I mean, he, he, he battled with everything. He, he wasn't as athletic as Wall, but he was more physical and, and tougher in some ways. You know what I mean? He was, he, was, he, was, he was good. He was real good. So I didn't answer your question, but I'm going <laughs> to say that Troy Barney's group, even though they didn't win a playoff, might be the best team that I've ever coached. All right. So maybe, maybe the best team, maybe the most talented team. How about the most special team? And it could be special for a variety of reasons. You know, sometimes there's just that team, for whatever reason, just something special about them that just always sticks out. It could be like the 2-16 and 16 team. Could be the Barney's team. Could it be one of your state championships team? Like, what's, what's the most special team, looking back on your on almost 20 years at Edward Little? Get We've had quite a few. We've had quite a few. But two that stand out to me, <clears throat> well, I mean, last year's team, you know, was was special for a lot of reasons. Like, they, they weren't the most talented team that I've ever coached. You know what I mean? And they weren't the most talented team in the state. But th they loved each other. That, that's probably one of the best teams I've ever coached. They didn't care who scored, who played, okay, who got the ball. Like, they just wanted to win. And like I said, like, I keep bringing this up, but when we went to team camps, we played some teams that when they looked over and saw us, you could see them just laughing. Saying, We're gonna <laughs> and our boys just go out, like, they didn't know what to think. Like, they, they were in shock that our boys would just, just physically just manhandle them. So last year's team is definitely, and, 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 and that's nothing like with coaching either. You know what I mean? Like, like, they just loved each other so much. They were always with each other. So that was one of the groups. Um, Troy's sophomore year, we were 5-13, and 13, and 10 of those losses were by six points or less. And Troy was, like, one year away from being, like, a special, special player. His junior year, he was, like, 26 a game. Yeah, he was special. And his sophomore year, it was, like, 12 a game. And he was good, but, like, you know, we weren't super, super good, but we like, we just, we were in every game and that was a really fun group. Um, and the other group that really stands out to me is a, a kid played for me named Corey Terrio. Uh, he was our all state player that year. Um, but there, there was nothing else. Like we were small. Uh, actually, that's a junior year. My bad. Cause Kyle was on that group, Kyle Philbrook. Okay. And Eric Prue and Ben Hartnett. We were small and we were tiny. And, and we got matched up in the, in the Eastern Maine final with Bangor. And that's when Bangor, they were always big. But they had Weston. They had, um, oh, gosh, I'm blanking out now. Sue Blue. Okay, they had uh, Bernstein. They were all 6'4 or bigger and big. And we were just a bunch of tiny little guards. Corey Terrio was 6'2". Probably 170 was my center. <laughs> and we played, we just spread you out. 
and cut and passed and attacked and and we lost to Bangor in the Eastern Maine final by like two. Um, and, and, and that team, again, had no reason playing with Bangor. You know, physically, they were just so much better than us. But we just went out and just, we just spread the floor and just ran. And it was fun. Yeah. So those are three teams that stand out to me. It's funny you mentioned uh, Corey and Bo and Kyle. I used to – I worked hoop camp for two summers back, back in the day, and they were actually in camp at that point. They were actually still players back then. You could tell that they were going to be special, and they wound up being special. Yeah. Um, so you, you don't coach for as long as you do without being competitive. I'm wondering, is there a particular coach or program when they come to town or when you look at the schedule, like, okay, I can't wait to go up against this guy. Is there somebody who just brings your competitive juices out that you just love going head to head against? And like as a few, I think like Coach Gratham um, at Oxford Hills um, because I respect him so much, um, and and he gets his kids to play hard. If you've ever um, been able to coach against any Oxford Hills team at Oxford Hills, okay, it's like going to the county. You know, when you went to the county back in the day, you know that you were ten or fifteen points down already. And going to Oxford Hills is the same way. Plus, he coached when I played, um, so that's a really special and neat thing to be able to see. Um, Coach Russo, I have so much respect for uh, at Portland just because of everything that he's done. Um, he's done a great job. And you always, you got to make sure your kids are ready to play that because you know he gets his kids jacked up. Uh, they're going to play hard and attack you all the time. Um, put me on the spot. Tough. Think, 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 think. <laughs> uh, we don't play Brunswick anymore with the new classification, but it's always good to play against Coach Hanson for the same reasons. Uh, but, I mean, we're lucky. I mean, Coach Millington at South Point, we don't play them. Okay, We could in some new schedule, but we won't this year. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some great coaches, definitely. You mentioned all the great players you've had come through your program, and uh, you got one who's coming back. He was a sophomore last year. We just had our uh, first ever big-time fantasy draft last week. Yep. And uh, one of you guys was drafted, John Shea. Big John. Yeah. He was drafted number seven overall. Is that too high, too low, or just right? Do you think he's going to surprise some people this year? I think he's going to surprise some people. John has lost probably 35, 40 pounds. Well, we heard that's what people were saying on the podcast. He's Ever since the season ended, as soon as the quarantine stuff happened, it's been amazing because usually people gain weight. Well, John met with BJ, our trainer, and um, they talked about diet. And not being able to get into a gym during the initial um, quarantine stuff, just by diet alone, John lost pretty close to 30 pounds. And then things opened back up and he got in the gym. And he's had one of the best summers of a kid that I've coached. He's been in the gym every day. He's been working on his game every day. See, and John, like a lot of kids today, thinks that he has to shoot threes to be able to be um, – you know, like a scholarship player or whatever that is. And it's funny, I just talked to him today about, you know, a scholarship player and, you know, what that is and what it's not. But I said, let coaches decide that. You just work as hard as you can and the coach is going to recruit you, okay, based on what they need, okay, not, not what you are. I mean, what you are is part of it. But um, so anyway, but I said, John, listen, anybody can guard you at 18 feet, okay? Nobody can guard you when you're, getting your butt on that block, you know, um, and he's unstoppable on the post. And he had a great summer um, working on that. And I said, listen, I still want you to expand your game, okay, and be able to do some of those things, be a trail four, you know, um, so let's work on that part as well. Uh, but he's had a really good summer. Whether that's too high or low, I mean, hey, I saw your list. There's some great players ahead of him, you know what I mean? And, and, and there's some great players behind, and, and it's, it's tough. It's tough to tell. Um, He's my guy, so I'm biased. I love John. And he's a winner. You know, he's a sophomore. And he, he was a big part of us, a big, big part of us winning a state championship. Uh, so I think, I think, hey, he should be on that list. And I think you guys did a great job with it. And also, I think one of the games that people would have been looking forward to this year, and hopefully there, there is some sort of season, is the Crosstown rivalry with Lewiston, right? Lewiston's going to be good this year, right? That, that, I'm, I'm guessing that's going to be a, a fun game. And could you speak to the rivalry? I like to talk to you guys about the particular rivalries that they're involved in. Auburn, Lewiston, I haven't heard much about it. I mean, I know about it, but I haven't actually heard people talk about it that are in it. Can you talk yeah. about that rivalry? Oh, it's great. You know, I mean, our kids, you know, with social media, again, our kids have grown up together, and, and – 
all the kids grow up playing at the Y here in Auburn. So they've known each other their whole lives. And we play against each other in the summertime. Okay. And they see each other a lot. Um, but um, the last couple of years, okay, they have a, some really good players coming up through. And Ronnie's done a good job um, building up excitement and energy in the program. Uh, they're going to be really good. Really good. They got two guys who are six, seven or bigger. Uh, they got some explosive and athletic guards. Um, they're going to be a team to deal with in, uh, in double A. There's no question about it. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Hopefully, we'll be ready for them. And hopefully, if there is a, like a regular season, double A North is going to be, it's going to be tough, right? You got Bangor is going to be good. Yeah. You guys, Lewiston is going to be competitive. Yeah, no question. And Oxford Hills has some good young kids coming up through as well. And Chad Polkman always does a great job with Wyndham. I mean, they, they were a minute away from beating us last year in the playoffs. You know, he does a really good job with the kids that he has every single year. So I'm going to try to get you out of here on, on one more, the most difficult question of the night. If you had to give me a starting five of Auburn guys in your time there, could you do it? Could you do it if you had to? <laughs> okay. Because I, I, I bet you the, your guys want to hear it. They, they want to hear from Coach. They want to hear from Coach if they, if you, if they crack okay. the top five. Okay. I'm going to go. Obviously, Troy. Okay. Wall. I'm going to go Corey Terrio. I'm going to go. Ian Malikas. And I'm going to go Kyle's my point guard. Kyle Phil at the one. I didn't think you were going to answer it. I'm, I'm happy you did, but I'm, I'm a little surprised I you did. To. I had to. But you know what? If you ask me it tomorrow, it might be a little bit different too. Yeah. But I'll think I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be sitting in bed tonight saying, oh, shoot. Okay. So-and-so should have done that instead. There, there's so many. There's so many. I've been blessed. Yeah, it's, it's a terrible, terrible luxury to have that you, you have to really sit there and think about who's going to go on my five. I mean, it just, it just yeah. goes to show you guys have had tremendous team success, but just incredible individual talent as well that's come through there in your time there. They've made me look like a good coach. Uh, I've been blessed, definitely, no question. Good answer right there. That's, that's the, the politically correct answer right there. Before we get up out of here, I always give my guests a chance to say a little something if they want to say something, if there's any rumors you want to address, any, anything you want to say at all, this is your chance to say something before we get up out of here. Hey, I just, you know, I think that we're lucky um, being in Maine. Uh, like I said before, Maine high school basketball is a special, special thing. And um, you know, hopefully we have our season this year as close to normal as we can. We all want to have, you know, championships and, and whatever else we can. Um, and I'm not saying that we have to settle for things um, that are less than what we should have. But given the circumstances going on in our country, you know, the safety of our kids, and our parents and our grandparents and everybody else is definitely the most important thing. Uh, but if we can play and play safely, I think we've proven that we can, uh, that we need to have that opportunity to do that. And uh, just enjoy the season, enjoy the competition, enjoy uh, the, prepare, the preparation of the season and, um, and have fun. And it's going to be another fun year, regardless of, of however it's played out. Absolutely. Hopefully things get back to normal because I know personally, I, I was, I'm looking forward to just seeing a lot of great basketball this winter. And there's just so much talent all around the state and I'm yes. hoping that we can see, see some of that. But uh, so. hey, thanks to Coach Adams for coming through on Big Time Hoops the Podcast. One of the best going, two state rings, chasing that third, and just one of the best programs uh, in the state is run the right way. And uh, you can tell by the, the talent that comes out of there and just the character of the people that come out of there as well. So everyone speaks very, very high. That thank you. Program. So thank you, Coach, for coming through tonight. Appreciate thank you for having me. Thank you very much. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Big Time Hoops, the podcast. Make sure you're checking out all of our previous episodes, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, they're up there. And we'll see you next week with another Big Time episode of Big Time Hoops. We'll see you.